2030, there were 2 million vehicles in Britain and 170,000 miles of road. M1, Britain's first motorway, is the beginning of a new deal for drivers on the country's alarmingly congested roads. By 1959, the rise in vehicle ownership had triggered an ambitious program of new road construction. I declare the road open. A small ceremony, but a big event. And traffic was soon taking this opportunity of trying out a new experience in British road travel. But when the M25 was completed in 1986, the motorway dream was beginning to turn sour. Vehicle numbers were accelerating far quicker than the increase in road length. If the trend continues, then by the turn of the century we face a congestion problem that will dwarf anything we see today. But subtle changes are occurring on our roads. Strange patterns cover their surface. Anonymous grey boxes appear at their side. Microprocessor technology is slowly being introduced to control the movement of traffic. Could we head off the shortfall in road space by making our existing roads more efficient? This program will put road technology to the test. Seven of the country's top traffic experts have been invited to conduct an experiment. A test drive from Milton Keynes to Maidstone to try out some of the country's most congested roads during the morning rush hour. Hello. 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 Uh, I've got Equinox 1. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Equinox 2. Thank you. Oh, yes. And and take down down the the Mike McDonald and Margaret Bell are to take car number one on the shortest route through the centre of London. Experts in urban traffic control, they'll be looking at the management of London's congested centre. Our problem is going to be getting through that tunnel. Taking an easterly route through the Dartford Tunnel, Peter Bonsall and Howard Kirby will examine the effects of the M25, the long-awaited London Orbital Motorway. George Hazel and John Whitten will take the longest, but maybe not the slowest, route to the west. They'll look at techniques to keep traffic moving on congested motorways. Trying a different approach is Martin Mugridge. Can you read timetables? Yeah, we'll <laughs> oh dear, you're going to have a problem. One answer to congestion on the roads is encouraging people to travel by rail. So he will try out a new service that takes mainline trains straight through the centre of London. But to do this, he will have to leave from Bedford instead of Milton Keynes. Needing a head start to catch his train, he's the first to leave. Hello, Bedford Railway Station, please. Catch the 847. A monitoring group is based at the Middlesex Polytechnic in North London. Here, in the Road Traffic Research Centre, Professor Chris Wright is accompanied by Professor Peter Hills from Newcastle University and Dr. Ivan Brown, an expert on driver behaviour from the Applied Psychology Unit in Cambridge. The testers will report their progress using that most successful piece of modern technology, the mobile phone. What would you prefer? Heathrow and a fly in, I think. <laughs> <laughs> a quick helicopter. Ah, there they are now. Hello? Chris? John Wharton. And George Hazel in Equinox 3. You're ready to go? Yes, we're ready to go. Yes, it's 8.30, you can go now. Right. Milton Keynes has the distinction of being the only city in Britain designed from scratch with the car in mind. Its tree-lined boulevards form an American-style grid pattern. It was established in the early 60s to cope with London's population overspill. To maintain easy communication with London, they built it next to the M1 motorway. And it's the M1 that all three cars will use as the first leg of their journey southeast. Hello, 
Chris. This is Equinox 3, John Wooden and George Hazel. Hello, John. We have just joined the M1. Well, we're moving south down the M1 now. The traffic is fairly light. All right, John. Bye. Bye. They've, of course, missed the roadworks on the M1, which are further up to the north yes. there, so they're not having any problems. To the north of Junction 14, traffic is held back by a contraflow. The reason for these roadworks is quite simple. The pounding of increasingly heavy traffic has caused damage deep beneath the road surface. The load-bearing concrete road base is beginning to crumble and break down. The M1 has simply worn out. With key routes like this already at capacity, an urgent use for technology is in developing roads that last longer. Greater thicknesses of dense, bituminous macadam now make up a road base that should last 40 years. This prediction is based on work at the Transport and Road Research Laboratory. The effects of years of heavy wheel loads can be produced on this rig in a matter of weeks, allowing different materials to be tested to destruction. Roads need regular inspection to detect early signs of damage. Again, technology can minimize traffic delays. Laser beams in this trailer check for rutting and lack of skid resistance while traveling at 50 miles an hour. This means it can be used on a motorway with little disruption to normal traffic. It's now 8.46. The Equinox cars have been travelling for 16 minutes, nine of them on the motorway. At a steady 70, their average journey speed is rising. However, a lot of traffic is going considerably faster. Yes, well you wouldn't get the flows that you're achieving on the motorways with, without people piling on the pressure. Gone are the days when people respected the speed limits. Martin Mogridge has made it to Bedford Railway Station with about a minute to spare. The new Thameslink service uses the reopened Snow Hill Tunnel in the City of London, going on to cross the river at Blackfriars. To get to Maidstone, you'll have to make two easy connections. Hello, Chris? Are you hearing me well? We're just leaving Bedford. We're due in at King's Cross at 9.46. All right, Martin, you can sit back and read your paper. Okay. See you later. Bye. He's gotten to Bedford Station. He'll be at King's Cross at 9.46. Closer to London, a lot of extra traffic is joining the M1, part of the morning commuter rush. Hello, Chris. Yes, we're just approaching uh, Junction 9 on the M1, and there is some uh, fairly heavy traffic developing ahead. I think we're going to have to slow down and probably be joining a queue. Bye. Yes, the position at the minute is still fairly free flow, fairly stable conditions, but it is getting a little congested and I'm having to slow down slightly. The capacity of a road is the number of vehicles that can physically pass along it. It's tempting to think that if everyone drove a bit faster, the flow would increase and the road would become more efficient. Unfortunately, the opposite is the case. Yes, it's interesting because as the traffic flow builds up on a motorway, then speeds gradually begin to reduce until you get very close to the capacity of the road, and then speeds suddenly start to fall. Capacity is less at higher speeds because of the disproportionate increase in stopping distance. According to the highway code, a car travelling at 70 needs three times the road space of a car travelling at half the speed. At 70, the maximum safe capacity for each lane is 1,100 vehicles an hour. As speed drops, capacity increases. Maximum flow occurs, in theory, at about 18 miles an hour. Only if drivers are prepared to close up on the car ahead can greater flows be achieved. And this is what happens. It's highly dangerous, but motorists tend not to perceive the risk. Ivan Brown believes he knows why. Well, in my view, one of the, one of the problems on densely um, uh, populated motorways is that drivers tend to perceive progress in terms of relative speed. 
And what they forget is their speed over the ground. They just don't perceive the information from the texture of the road surface that actually tells them how fast they're going. And in fact, they may perceive zero risk in situations like this simply because they're making no progress relative to the traffic around them. Given that people are prepared to drive like this, can technology make it any safer? At a test track in Germany, these cars have their brakes and engine speed linked together electronically. If one car slows, they all slow. They take up a fraction of a road space of conventionally driven cars. Could this be a realistic way of increasing motorway capacity? Back on the M1, Peter Bonsall has his doubts. Well, I think some of the ideas such as linking cars together to travel in chains, which have been around for quite a long time, are really not that sensible. If one's moving to that sort of level, you might as well go the whole hog and drive by train anyway. Some of the other things, uh, more information about environmental conditions, congestion ahead, warnings, all of these will be very useful and will probably result in increased throughput on the roads since people will be able to use them more effectively. If taking control away from drivers is not on, helping them make sensible decisions is one way to go. Here in the West Midlands, overhead gantry signalling is backed up by extensive closed-circuit television. When congested traffic is seen to come to a standstill, the operator sets a matrix signal to warn approaching traffic. This system is now quite old, and the computer sometimes scrambles the message. Advisory speed warnings also lose credibility if they're not regularly updated. Back on the M1, the Equinox cars are passing a test site for an automatic system that exploits a piece of technology called the inductive loop. Inductive loops were first used to detect cars at car park barriers. That should give us an inductive change of about 25 microhenries. Scientists at the Transport and Road Research Laboratory have devised numerous other uses for this very handy device. Under each of these white diamonds is a loop of copper cable. An alternating current is passed through the loop, which sets up a magnetic field above it. As a car passes through the magnetic field, it will induce changes in it that can be picked up by the detection circuitry. A single loop can detect the passage of a vehicle. Two loops a fixed distance apart will give the vehicle speed. In the system being tested on the M1, inductive loops continually monitor the flow of traffic. If the speed suddenly slows, warning signals will switch on automatically to alert approaching drivers. Okay, we're just approaching the M25, John. What, what are we looking for? You need to branch left and join the M25 following Heathrow. Right. The Equinox cars are ending the first leg of their journey on the M1 and will now split up. They've covered 34 miles at an average speed of 50 miles an hour. Equinox 2 should leave us here and uh, go towards the Dartford Tunnel. Peter in Equinox 2. We are just leaving the M1 onto the M25. Traffic flowing fairly well. The M25 London Orbital was finally completed two years ago. Built at a cost of a billion pounds, it runs for 117 miles, making it the longest city bypass in the world. A road round London has been needed for years. The 1944 Abercrombie plan was for five concentric rings. The M25 now follows some of the route. But why has it taken over 40 years to build? Peter Bonsall. Well, I think to be fair, the first perhaps 10 years, there were other priorities in clearing up after the war. And from about 1955, the motorway program had uh, become established, but other motorways were seen as being rather more important. Then, from about the mid-70s, 
1960s, the M25 was becoming uh, needed, and the problem was that at that time, environmental pressures were beginning to become apparent, and so when the proposals were put up, there were a large number of objections, which in order to deal with properly, uh, took a considerable length of time. Now that the M25 is complete, does it achieve its purpose? To the west, many sections jam solid at peak periods. Drivers must wonder why the volume of traffic could not have been foreseen. In Equinox 3, John Wooden was one of those who produced the traffic forecasts. How did they get it so wrong? Well, we didn't get it so wrong. Um, in fact, uh, in the original forecasts, ones that I was personally involved in, in the early 1960s, we were forecasting flows of 60 to 100,000 vehicles per day in, for the year 1981. Um, and in fact, the flows are within that range, perhaps slightly higher. I think you have to remember that the road was constructed in, at a time when there was a considerable amount of opposition to this type of facility. People really questioned the need for the road at all. Uh, and now it's there, of course. They say, well, why didn't you build it bigger? There's no denying that building a new motorway causes extensive environmental harm. It divides communities, generates incessant noise, and consumes vast acreage of countryside, especially at intersections. Attempts have been made to lessen the M25's impact. Cuttings and tunnels have been used to hide it from view. Here, there's even a cricket pitch on the tunnel roof. But new roads like this change more than our environment. They produce major shifts in the way we conduct our lives. George Hazel has been studying this effect. Well, transport's about accessibility. Um, when you increase accessibility, you, you increase attractiveness, especially for carbon uh, trips. And the M25 is undoubtedly an attractive proposition which will increase development pressures around it. Proposals for new retail and business developments are multiplying rapidly along its route. The M25 is drawing London out from the centre. Given the go-ahead, these developments will encourage a society more than ever dependent on the motor vehicle. This is causing consternation among planners. I think what is worrying about the effect of the M25 is what I would call the excess traffic generation. That is, trips that didn't take place before, but are encouraged to do so by the provision of the road. And uh, presumably this has, um, uh, this rubs off on the, on the network for London itself, because all of the radial routes are now going to be busy with people travelling yes. longer journeys. So it generates traffic not only on the M25, but on the radial routes too. It's now 9.15. In the Thameslink service, Martin Mulgridge is passing through Hertfordshire. His average speed compares favourably with the cars. Equinox 3 is held up by traffic again, their average speed dropping fast. Equinox 2 is still making good time. Traffic on this section is below capacity. Still on the M1 is Equinox 1. Their next task is to plan a route through town. Congestion in London is highly variable, and like everyone else, their main source of information is the radio. You know who this is a local Communication is slightly easier. A thousand feet above your street, Capital Radio and Continental Airlines bringing the latest traffic news as it happens from Ross Kane in the Flying Eye. Gorgeous down here, but not so gorgeous down on the road. Actually, again, Blackwater, right way back to the crowd about by Black. Black even itself, that was crowded right the way across the town. Roadworks in the A10, that's Shoreditch High Street, Bethnal and Green Road, and more roadworks at uh, Sunbury Cross, causing you delays on the A308. That's the Staines Road West, coming into town, and then you're going to face the rigours of the Cambridge roundabout. There is already a five mile... On a clear day, the view from the air certainly takes some beating as a way to get instant traffic information. But the traffic update is an integral part of the morning show and has to match its racy style. Sorry, was it Grand Tad on Sunday? Was it quite might have been? It might... Oh. This certainly makes good entertainment, 
but is it the best way of communicating with the motorist? Um, well, not really, because he, he mentioned rather a lot of different place names that I couldn't find on the map quick enough, and I really couldn't um, follow exactly what he, he, he was trying to say to us, so, so I found it n not very useful, in fact. Well, the world has only got a short time, so I've got to pack in as much as I possibly can, which end up talking like Peter O'Sullivan, two furlongs from home. I th I've always tried to make it as entertaining as possible because otherwise I think if you're sitting having your cornflakes you're not really very interested in what's happening on the North Circular but I try to develop it so that it's, um, it's informational and, and as up to date and as accurate as, as you can possibly make it but also it's wherever we can it's funny and just entertaining. In the future radios like this will automatically tune in to traffic reports on any local station fairly slow going and roadworks on the M25 in Surrey are causing holdups once more this and report is coming direct from the AA Roadwatch studios in North London clockwise carriageway finally some vague details just coming in of an accident on the M25 in Hertfordshire it's on the clockwise carriageway with no further details at the moment but more in the next report Marianne Randall AA Roadwatch to be useful to motorists this information has to be as full and accurate as possible what are the AA's main sources, and can they be sure that they're up to date? David Marsh is their development manager. There are about three or four main sources. The police is one of them. We've got a direct link to Scotland Yard, to the traffic control centre. Our own AA patrols out on the road is another. Local authorities and the Department of Transport. And we do get a limited amount of information from the service companies like gas, water and telephone. Has anybody heard anything about the accident on the M25? Chigwell have just been on line junctions 23 to 24 yeah. on the clockwise carriageway. That information came in on the direct line from the police control centre on the M25. We then followed that up uh, and will follow it up throughout the morning. As soon as they get airtime, this information can be broadcast to drivers. There's news too for Equinox 1 coming into town, approaching the city. A delay southbound on the A1 at Archway. Just wait of traffic making it very slow going there this morning. It may be better for us to continue along the motorway down to Junction 1 and take the A41 through... They the decide to avoid the city and head instead for the West End. Though if everyone else is following this advice, Archway and the city could now be clear and the West End route jammed. Driver information faces an obstacle in its own success. Back on the M25, Equinox 3 is still making slow progress. They speed forward for short bursts and then come to a complete standstill for no apparent reason. These phantom traffic jams are a regular puzzle for drivers on the M25. They are, in fact, caused by shock waves. Speeding up the flow of traffic shows how they occur. When drivers bunch together, they rely on fast reactions. If one car brakes, the drivers behind tend to overreact and brake progressively harder till they come to a stop. From the original incident, a shock wave is triggered, which can be seen to pass slowly back up the stream of traffic, bringing it to a temporary halt. Flow in these conditions is highly unstable and seriously reduces the motorway's capacity. If we plot the speed and volume flow of traffic in a morning rush hour, it can be seen that once instability sets in, speed and volume flow are both greatly reduced. There's an opportunity here for technology to intervene. Once a, a jam forms, it's actually very, very difficult to make it dissipate. And you have to try and find ways in controlling the traffic on a motorway to stop that initial incident affecting the traffic behind it. And that's the sort of thing that we try to do in uh, access control. The purpose of access control is to prevent traffic volume building beyond the critical value at which instability sets in. On the M6 to the north of Birmingham, there's an access control system up and running. It uses traffic signals on the slip road to regulate the quantity of traffic joining the motorway in direct response to the flow conditions on the main carriageway. Inductive loops measure the volume of traffic coming up to the junction on the motorway. Similar loops on the slip road measure the traffic wishing to join. 
If the entering vehicles would take the total beyond the critical volume, the lights on the slip road go red. When there's a slight lessening in the flow on the main carriageway, or when the maximum red time is reached, the signals go green to let in a bit more traffic. Access control, or ramp metering, has been in use here for two years. The police are certainly happy with it. The main difference is that prior to ramp metering, we had stationary traffic in small blocks, all the way from Junction 10 at Bentley, down to Gravelly Hill and into Birmingham there on the interchange. Uh, that resulted in us setting signals in small blocks each morning at various locations, normally there, there and there. We don't need to do that anymore because with the control of the traffic entry in there at Junction 10, it allows a steady stream of traffic to flow through uh, and we don't get very many occasions where we need to set overhead gantry signals to warn moving traffic of stationary traffic ahead. John Wooden's consultancy firm installed the M6 system. Could it solve the problems on the M25? There are undoubtedly locations on the M25 where it could bring very significant benefits. And that type of control uh, has an immediate effect. And indeed, it provides a very high rate of return. Uh, it pays for itself very quickly. For example, the system in Birmingham has paid for itself already, and it's only been in operation about two years. Why haven't we got it yet on the M25? Um, I wish I knew. <laughs> it's now 9.25. Equinox 3 is stuck in a jam around Junction 19, their average speed still dropping. Equinox 2 is still making good progress to the east. They missed the hold-ups mentioned earlier on the radio. Martin Mogridge has just reached St Albans. The train is making comparable speed with the cars, though he started from Bedford 17 minutes after them. Equinox 1 has now reached the bottom of the M1, with few interruptions. We've now come off the high-grade motorway, and we're entering the more urban road network of London. Clearly, there are very substantial problems when we start to do that, because we're dumping a, a large amount of traffic onto a road network which was built and designed a long time ago when there was no thought of the sort of level of traffic that would be using it at the moment. The main problems occur at intersections. They can be rebuilt to separate the flows at different levels, though this is a very high cost approach that takes up space. A more feasible way of squeezing further capacity out of central London's existing roads is by putting the traffic signals under computer control. Equinox 1 is just entering one of the central systems. Oh, hello, Chris. It's Equinox 1 here. We're just entering um, the fixed time system of control on Finchley Road. Fixed time plans are used to synchronize the traffic signals within a local area. Their green times are also adjusted at different times of the day to match expected traffic flows. Computer power is needed to work out the effects of adjusting one signal timing on all the other junctions in the vicinity. Central area of London here, mm -hmm. coming up to the current fixed time area of Finchley Road, running up to the north. All London's traffic lights are now handled by this computer centre in Westminster. Can you see there's the, the area that we're talking about on the map. The original software to work out fixed time plans was developed by Dennis Robertson. Well, uh, a fixed time plan, we work these out by sending people out to measure traffic flows at all the junctions in the network. They then bring that data back and we put it into a computer that alters the signal timings to try and minimise the queues. And it has repeated goes at that many thousands of times and tries to find the very best settings of the signals that minimise the queues in the area. Because fixed time plans are preset, they cannot respond to fluctuations in the traffic. But as Equinox 1 passes down the Edgware Road, they encounter SCOOT, the Split Cycle Offset Optimization Technique. This is the state of the art of computerized traffic signal control. Within each SCOOT zone, the timings of all the signals are adjusted automatically to respond to the changes in traffic. 
the exit of each junction, an inductive loop counts the vehicles leaving. This information is fed back to the scoot computer, which adjusts the green time of each adjoining junction to match the volume of traffic approaching it. The complexity of adjusting all these signals in real time is quite mind-boggling. Can it actually work? Oh, yes. Uh, our estimates suggest that they'd get, get about reductions of delay of something of the order of 20% or so. Um, it will vary from place to place, but this is a very worthwhile reduction in congestion, and we'd expect that to happen over wide areas. So, yes, there'll be very distinct benefits. There are plans to change all central London's traffic signals to the scoot system in a bid to increase the network's efficiency. However, there may be a drawback to this. Martin Mogridge believes we're setting ourselves up for the super jam. Yes, if you take a system and make it more efficient by taking out the redundancy of it, when anything goes wrong, it'll go wrong in a far worse way than it ever did before. An example of that in London is the super jam that we had on the 7th of December last year. An accident at Blackfriars, quite a minor accident, and yet we had 50,000 vehicles stuck in a traffic jam for quite a lot of the evening. That's because we've made the system more efficient, we've got far more traffic in it than we've ever had before, and so it just really snarls up in a very bad way whenever anything goes wrong. The time is now 9.55. Hello? Chris, Equinox 2. Hello, Peter. Here it is. We're about two miles from the Dartford Tunnel and we can see the queue. Peter's in sight of the Dartford Tunnel, just a couple of miles out. Okay. Well, thank you, Peter. Bye. How are everybody else doing? Um, well, Equinox 2 has run into the queue at the Dartford Tunnel. Um, this is John Peter. He says that Equinox 3 has got down to the junction with the M3 now and he's got clear conditions. It, so it sounds then as though we're neck and neck with Equinox 2. It depends how long it takes uh, Equinox 2 to get through the queue at the Dartford Tunnel. Equinox 2 were always the clear favourites, but the Dartford Tunnel queue is moving slower than expected. Meanwhile, Martin Mogridge is just leaving Blackfriars. Hello, Chris. We're now just crossing the Thames. It's a beautiful day. That's Martin. He's just crossing the River Thames now. And it's a very comfortable journey. Good. Well, you'll be able to do a lot more research, won't you? <laughs> Bye now. Equinox One is now threading its way down Park Lane towards Hyde Park Corner. Observant motorists might have noticed subtle changes to some of London's traffic signals. They've sprouted strange extra lamps which never light up. They are in fact infrared beacons used to transmit and receive data as part of an experimental car navigation system called AutoGuide. Oh yes, yes there, there it is. is. Just down there. Equinox One are about to investigate. Oh, there we are, eating us. The auto guide running at the moment is only a small scale demonstration. Best of luck with Within it. a year, it's hoped that interested commercial organizations will set up a fully working pilot scheme. The man responsible for coordinating all this is transport consultant Ian Catling. Okay. Auto guide equipped cars have a small infrared transceiver fitted behind the windscreen that communicates with the roadside beacons as it goes past. OK, then, Ian, are you going to show us how this works? Yes, I can take you to Westminster Bridge. I can bring that up on the screen. And we, if we set off, I'll explain it as we go. Right. Autoguide will now lead Equinox One along the best route through the West End, taking instructions from the roadside beacons that they pass. Now, as we go through these traffic signals, you can see what looks like a filter arrow on either side, which is in fact one of the infrared beacons. And immediately, it's showing us that there's a left turn up ahead. It's also indicating that it's a fork rather than a strict left turn. As the car passes a beacon, it receives a digitized map of all the possible routes in the area. The auto guide unit in the car determines where the car is and which route it should take to get to the chosen destination. And as soon as there's any need to worry about a turn coming up, it'll give you 
an audible warning like that. Their auto guide scores over other guidance systems is in using two-way communication. Cars transmit back to the beacons their journey times over the last part of the route. A central computer logs all the journey times and works out where jams are forming. It can therefore send drivers on the least congested routes. Following the auto guide car in Equinox 1, Mike McDonald remains cautious about the technology it uses. It's important that auto guide isn't over promoted at this stage as a new advanced technological system which will solve all the traffic problems. It won't. For small numbers of vehicles, it will certainly guide them well through the networks and it will absorb spare capacity that exists. If you have 50 or 100 percent fitted, then you have some quite considerable difficulties of guiding the vehicles to optimum routes. Clearly, as more and more vehicles get equipped, there's more and more data coming back to the control center. So there is an implication on the amount of, of computing power, but it's certainly um, of the same sort of order as the existing traffic control sy systems that, and those running Scoot. Left. Well, it's brought us down to Parliament Square. It'll take us round and um, onto Westminster Bridge. And in, fact, left. in fact, it'll, it should take us across to the other side before it tells us that we've reached the destination that I keyed in at the start. Take the Auto guide will clearly be invaluable to drivers new to the area, but will it actually help London's traffic problems? It's not a cure-all for congestion, and um, certainly the, the, the same questions of suppressed demand and um, increased capacity come up as, as with um, the, the conventional traffic control systems. It's, it's, it's a separate question, really, of whether there is a major suppressed demand there. Of course, it will make it easier to drive in London and, and more attractive, and it will spread some of the congestion uh, and make it more even. To be commercially viable, AutoGuide has to offer motorists real benefits that they will want to buy. Destination reached. Trundling comfortably through South London, Martin Mogridge has just overtaken Equinox One. Is AutoGuide going to speed up journeys by car? No, I'm afraid it isn't. It's going to allow people to find a shortest route, but certainly not a quickest route, because what will happen will be that all the extra capacity that will be generated will be taken up by extra cars coming in. The speed is set by the equilibrium in journey speeds between the car and public transport. This is Martin Mogridge's network equilibrium theory. It holds that if the capacity of the road network is increased, rail passengers will switch to cars, taking up the extra capacity and causing the same congestion as before. But because there are now fewer rail passengers, the railway will put on fewer trains. People will not be attracted back to rail travel until traffic congestion gets worse than it was before road capacity was increased. So the net result of improving the roads has been to make road travel worse rather than better. Not surprisingly, Mogridge finds his colleagues reluctant to share his views. You can hardly expect people who've been working for many years professionally to change their ideas all at once. It, because it says par partially that what they've been doing in the past is wrong. And people who've been building roads, who've been designing traffic management schemes, who've been working out computer control systems for traffic, it would be very surprising if they suddenly turned around and said, oh, well, this actually hasn't improved the situation at all. But that's what we seem to be finding. Equinox 2 has finally made it into the Dartford Tunnel. This two-lane bottleneck isn't wide enough for the M25 traffic, and a second river crossing, a road bridge, is to be built here by private companies, who will recoup their investment by charging tolls. Motorists generally accept paying to use a tunnel or a bridge, but the time may have come to charge for the use of roads. But you can also try to reduce the demand by pricing the road in some way. I think one would look to uh, a congestion tax, that is where you're charged 
uh, according to the level of congestion prevailing at the time. And a toll road can do this, but at the moment, of course, that involves stopping people and collecting tolls. Again, there are quite promising technical possibilities for uh, tolling people without them stopping. There's no point in causing a traffic jam at a toll booth to relieve congestion elsewhere. Electronic systems that charge motorists without them stopping make tolling more feasible on both new and existing roads. They're based on Automatic Vehicle Identification, or AVI. Vehicles carry electronic transponders that pass an identification code to detectors in the road. British expertise in AVI technology is in demand around the world. Ian Catling worked on a system that was tried briefly in Hong Kong. Uh -huh. Ian Catling to see Peter Davis. Uh -huh. He has come to Nottingham to work with fellow consultant Peter Davis on an electronic toll system for clients in the United States. Hello, Peter. Hi. You have a good trip? Not bad. Traffic wasn't too bad. Mm -hmm. Good. So we want to talk about the three different technologies for the toll collection system. That's the inductive, the microwave, and the infrared. Right, I've got some of the um, Hong Kong equipment with me. Uh, this is one of the electronic number plates mm -hmm. as fitted to the 2,000 odd vehicles in Hong Kong. Mm. Uh, Quite big and heavy really, aren't they? But for robustness and security. Mm -hmm. The Hong Kong experience shows that AVI transponders like this can be made to work. Though choosing a different transmission frequency might bring extra benefits. What Catling and Davis are now doing is combining the AVI technology with a system that automatically identifies the vehicle's class and weight. For this, a pressure sensing device called the piezoelectric strip is being developed at the University of Nottingham. So this is the piezo test rig. We have a sensor actually in here and the rig is running. We're pulse loading it through this hydraulic ramp. This flexible rubber strip is far cheaper than a conventional weigh bridge. The sensor inside it is simply a coaxial cable containing piezoelectric crystals which produce an electrical charge when compressed. On the lower trace we see the applied load, each pulse representing one wheel passage, and above it you can see the response of the piezo closely mirroring it. On the Nottingham Ring Road, they're testing a combination of the two technologies to provide both AVI and vehicle classification. Control monitoring Toll sites of the future could be as unobtrusive as this. A pair of piezoelectric strips give details of the axle weight, axle number and axle spacing of each vehicle. Toll charges can be varied automatically on the basis of this information. When a vehicle with a transponder comes by, its AVI number is picked up by a separate antenna. The toll can be charged automatically to the owner's account. Does automatic toll technology like this open the way to road pricing in Britain? I think new toll roads would be politically acceptable and very much in demand by the public. It's possible that once people got into the habit of having these AVI devices on their cars, it might be more acceptable to charge for existing roads. But even then, I, I still have my doubts and I see the future being in new roads with tolls rather than old roads with tolls. Hello. Hi there, Chris. Hello, Margaret. We're um, following the route signposted A2, A20 to Folkestone. It's 10.26. Auto Guide didn't improve their journey speed, but at least Equinox 1 didn't get lost. Martin Mogridge's initial lead over them is receding as his slow suburban train is calling at every station. John Wooten's hope is that Equinox 2 have been held back by the Dartford Tunnel, allowing Equinox 3 to take the lead. Hello again, Chris. Reporting our position again, we're just approaching Junction 9. Are Equinox 2 still uh, ahead of us? They are. Yes. I think this will be a last report before we arrive. And at 10.47, Howard Kirby and Peter Bonsall in Equinox 2 do indeed beat them to the finish line at Maidstone. Welcome. Thank you. You're the first. Good, good journey. Thank you. 
Yes, yes, not too bad. Too well, why did you come? Found it off the tunnel. Go over the first one, and at the second one, I think we should turn right. Okay. Well, there's the hotel. Fifteen minutes later, right. Equinox 3 are in sight of the line, set at the end of the N20 motorway. Right, through the first one. It's right here, sorry, the first one, yes. Yeah. Great day, it's hotel. Interestingly, both N25 cars have the same average journey speed, though 47 miles an hour is hardly the sustained high-speed motoring that was promised at the beginning of the motorway age. Pointing to his watch. You beat us! Come on! <laughs> you only beat us by 20 minutes. Yes. What kept you then? Did you have a good trip? Yes, yes quite a good sorry. one, thank you. It's all right. Yeah. 11 19. And Martin Mogridge arrives at Maidstone. The weak link in his journey plan has been this slow suburban line through South London and Kent. Equinox 1 should just beat him, but no one's heard from them for some time. Hello. Oh, hello, it's Margaret. Hello, Margaret. It's 11.20, Margaret. You should be nearly there by now. Where are you? Well, we're at Lewisham, and we've a little problem. Oh, dear. If Equinox 1 is still in London, Martin Mogridge is now clearly ahead of them. This is an unexpected boost for the journey by rail. Their bottom hose has gone. <laughs> so, radiator water all over the road. <laughs> so where are they stuck? Well, they're stuck in South London on the A20. Yeah. Um, a few miles further on. They're going to get themselves sorted out. They're not giving up? No. no. Is this the man himself? Yes, it is. Well, now. You took exactly the same speed as he did uh, 25 years ago. Yes. Right. Right. Hello. Who's that? Well done. Well done. You're not last right. after all. Yeah. Yeah. Would you believe it? Yeah. <laughs> you made it. <laughs> it's now 12.15. Finally, Equinox 1 makes an unconventional finish. Hey oh, well. Oh, well, How about that? Well, well. Hey! Spotted. Only an hour and a half late. <laughs> On the back of the AA relay. Well, you've got to arrive in style. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Do we get the red carpet out or the yellow carpet? <laughs> <laughs> Hi there, we made it! We made it! Really, 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 really. <laughs> Deducting the delay caused by the breakdown, Equinox 1 would still have been beaten by both of the cars on the M25. But if journey speeds today are hardly impressive, what of the future? Will road technology be a match for the growing levels of traffic? In principle, I'm very optimistic about the technology. It can provide us with route guidance, it can provide us with electronic road pricing, and within the foreseeable future, it could even provide us with cars that will drive themselves automatically. But that's not the whole story. There are some major decisions required in the future because all of the, the control technology depends on having an acceptable capacity. Once the roads actually jam solid, traffic engineering can do little to assist. Tony Lee of the RAC offers the obvious response. The first priority must be to provide the maximum space and capacity and to invest adequately to expand and improve the road system uh, in the same way as other countries have been doing so. But will simply increasing capacity ease congestion in towns? Cars are very inefficient users of space and it really doesn't matter how much extra capacity we build, we're going to fill it up. It's a vicious circle, but there is one way to break it. You can see the level of congestion there is now, and if our forecasts are that it will get 50-60% worse within 10 years, then I think the pricing option comes back on the agenda. It may be on the agenda, but how quickly can we make a decision? The private sector is pushing for change. Getting uh, various levels of government to move forward quickly uh, to get the infrastructure in place to allow the private sector to put in the uh, uh, high-tech devices in the cars or on the roadside, that's the real difficulty.
the future of our roads is in the balance. If we keep them low-tech, we must accept the constraints of the growing weight of traffic. If we go for high-tech, we must accept the control of the silicon chip. Either way, our freedom of movement is likely to diminish. Thank you.